I think the, the harder you look for what's going to bring meaning in your life, the less likely you are to find it. Um, because what we tend to do is we tend to think, okay, if I can get just one more achievement, if I can collect one more achievement, if I can get one more thing, if I get one thing that I want, I'm just going to be so happy and satisfied. And it just doesn't work that way. And proof of that, of course, is, is that you look back on all the things that you got in your life that you wanted and we're going to give you all this meaning and it, and it never worked in the, in the past. So it's kind of ludicrous to think that it's going to start happening with the next thing that you get that you want. Welcome back to our CNN Morning News about 35 minutes after the hour. Stress seems more and more to be part of our daily lives. And no matter what the cause, stress can be a burden, but it doesn't have to be. A new book called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff has some tips for dealing with the things that cause stress. Richard Carlson is the author, and he joins us this morning from San Francisco. Morning, Dr. Carlson. Good to see you. Welcome back to Nonstop, everybody. I am here with Richard Carlson, a PhD who just happens to be an author, and what is really amazing, and we're so glad to have you here, he wrote the best-selling book for 1997 and 1998. You've probably heard of it, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, which is something we're all trying to do. Well, he's back with a new book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff at Work. Richard Carlson's Don't Sweat the Small Stuff became a phenomenon after spending over 100 consecutive weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list. Richard's simple lessons for life encouraged us to live as if each day were our last. When are you going to die? In 50 years? 10? Today? I often wonder, when listening to the news, did the person who died in the auto accident remember to tell his family how much he loved them? Did he live well? Did he love well? When people look back on their lives while on their deathbed, they wish that their priorities had been quite different. They wish they had spent more time with the people and activities that they truly loved. Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. His latest installment teaches readers how to improve their relationships. It's titled, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Love. <laughs> Author Richard Carlson joins us now with his wife and co-author, Chris Carlson, good morning. Good Hi. morning. Good morning to both of you. Thank you. Okay, you wrote this together. Does he practice what he preaches? Oh, he definitely does. Does a very good job at practicing what he preaches. Did you guys fight any at all putting this book oh, together? It was horrible. You fight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Actually, it was really great. It was You're a, kidding. A great chance to. No, not at all. It was a great chance to to reflect on what's worked in our marriage. We've been married 14 years and have two daughters, and yeah. great chance to. to all uh, couples should write a book on love. It's, it's a great way to, you know, talk about your issues and other people's issues without personalizing them. Did you learn a, a lot about each other? Definitely. That I would, you didn't know? Richard would write something and I'd say, oh, that's for me. When you're falling in love, those little things mean a lot. But when the honeymoon is over, those same little things can drive you crazy. On today's Body and Soul, the man who brought you the best-selling Don't Sweat the Small Stuff applies that same microscopic advice to your love life. Please welcome the authors of Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Love, Richard Carlson and his beautiful wife, Christine. Welcome to both of you. Now, we were talking in Hot Topics. You guys have been married 14 years. You have two beautiful daughters. Did you ever suffer from that four-year or seven-year itch that we were talking about in the Hot Topics? Oh, better ask Chris. Huh? Well, both of you. <laughs> Gosh, well, I know, like, when we were first married, we, we were together for four years prior to marriage, so we kind of had worked a lot of that stuff out by the time we got married. You figure your honeymoon's already over, so <laughs> get right into it. I, I, don't, I don't think there were too many little things like that for us. The thing is, a lot of times you can, you can think there's this insidious tendency that people have to think that the grass is going to be greener. Our philosophy always is that the grass usually isn't greener if you can focus more on what you have than what you want and what you don't have. You know, there's some simple things that, that we talk about that on the surface can seem kind of, oh yeah, that's easy to say, but does it really work? But for example, if you wake up in the morning and you're focusing on the things that you love about your spouse or your partner, rather than things that are irritating to you, it's really hard to have a hard day. It's really then what happens when you slow down and start focusing more on what you have than on what you want, 
then you start to notice that that which you have is quite beautiful and lovely. Now from that place of well-being and, and feeling like you have enough, and feeling like you, there's aspects of your life that you already like, that's when the game starts. That's not when it finishes. That's the place that, that allows you to then look around and say, wait a minute, I've got a good life. This would make it a little bit better. Hey, I could try this. This might make my life a little bit richer or fuller or more magical or more meaningful. We sort of had that um, kind of the Hollywood version of the fairy tale, you know, love at first meeting. Really right then and there I had a very um, clear talk with myself. I said, you know, Chris, this is going to go two ways for you. Richard's not coming back. He's gone. You're either going to go to bed and you're going to pull the covers up over your head and your friends are going to have to drag you out of bed in the morning. And or with your daughters watching, you're going to stand in this and you're going to honor Richard and you're going to honor your life on this earth. And I had never grieved before. I didn't know how to grieve. I refused to read a grief book at that time because I didn't want somebody to tell me how to grieve. But what I did was I relied on all the tools and the beautiful life of love that I had with my husband. Contentment is oftentimes looked at as something that you will get when you get what you want and then that's sort of the end point. It's not like that at all. The truth is contentment is something you find when you stop focusing on what you want and you start focusing more on what you have. And then from that place of contentment, you discover all sorts of aspects of your life that could, that could enhance it and make it even more magical than it already is.